All right. The Lord be with you. Make sure, am I on? Yes. My microphone is on. Well, welcome this morning here to worship on this Palm Sunday as we gather together today inside. I thought we could uh, gather here because it's a little cold and windy outside. And um, so I will get through all the rest of the announcements later in the service when I don't have to yell. So, uh, but otherwise, just we will have a, a brief liturgy. We will read the gospel, then we'll process in, and you can start singing. Stuart will give you the cue to start singing. The words are on the screen to follow along to glory, laud, and honor, which of course one must sing on Palm Sunday. And, uh, and that's it. So, let us pray. Mercifully assist us, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life everlasting through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 11th chapter. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The Gospel of our Lord. Everlasting God, in your endless love for the human race, you sent our Son, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to take on our nature and to suffer death on the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go ahead. of two. 
us pray. Dearest Lord Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit and show us your way as we gather disciples and friends like you did <laughs> during your ministry. Help us to follow your example, Jesus. We know we can't share God's love and build a loving kingdom here on earth by ourselves. Give us the wisdom and strength to minister to people in our church community, in Bible studies, in prayer groups, in outreach organizations, and fellowship gatherings, especially those who are struggling. And we pray for and thank all the faithful volunteers at Lord of Grace Church who minister to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday. The first reading is Isaiah 50, 4 through 9. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher. May I know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from the insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have, have not been disgraced Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The second reading is from Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here ends our readings. All right. We're going to jump straight into the children's sermon here. So I'd like to invite the kids come up today. Ugh. All right. Well, good to see you guys all here this morning on this. Did you notice anything different uh, at our service already? Yeah. Yeah, what was different? It's because of all the 
You got it. The palm trees that are here, right? And Palm Sunday is always an easy one to do in this climate because everybody's used to palm trees, right? And um, uh, you got to make sure you thank the liturgical arts people for uh, setting up all these beautiful palm trees and being nice enough to cut the tips off them so that we don't poke ourselves. Have you ever tried to pick, carrot, grab a palm branch? Yeah, they got big thorns on them. They're, they're actually pretty harsh. Um, so, but Palm Sunday, yes. So what happened on Palm Sunday? Why did we start out there and walk in here? I mean, makes things kind of confusing and everybody's trying to figure out what verse they're on. And, and why, would you, why would we start out there and come in here? Any idea? Just for the fun of it? To get our steps in? Nobody has any idea. Okay. Let's back up. You think... Yeah. I have an idea of we need to just... Yeah, that's why they cut the palm trees so on Josh because they were going to poke him right here and here and here and there. Yeah, that, that, that'd be pretty bad. That's all that's a over your face. That'd be, that's a lot of poking. Yeah, but you're right. Who was the first person who walked in and people threw palm branches down for? Jesus, yes. It was palm branches and it was cloaks. But if you're poor and you only have one cloak, are you going to want to throw it down? You're probably going to want to grab palm branches, right? Oh, yes? Okay, well, you can tell me about them later, but do you, does this have to do with palm trees? Okay. Okay. All right, well, thank you for telling me that. So, we're talking about palm trees, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, so, palm trees. So, Jesus comes in. He's walking on palm trees. What, did, what animal did they put him on? Did he walk on his feet? No. What animal did he ride in on? A donkey. A donkey, yes. Why a donkey and not a horse? Any idea why that is? Well, hold on. Why, why a donkey and not a horse? Hey, you. The dog, because of the horse tail? I think donkeys have a lot of hair on their tail. I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to think about that. Well, part of the reason I think Jesus rode on a donkey is because there was another king way before him who also rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and his name was David. David? King David rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and his son Solomon also rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. So when the king comes into Jerusalem, he rides on a donkey. It's a little, uh, they did it a little differently then. So Jesus is riding in, into the city, on a donkey, and they're throwing down the palm branches, see, we, wait, to say that Jesus is the what? Jesus is the king. That's their way of saying he's the king, because kings didn't, were, would always get something rolled out for them. So Jesus would come down, on the, on the palm trees, on a donkey, and that's what we remember on Palm Sunday. Yeah? The, the donkeys in a cave? Cave. Oh, okay. Well, that's right. You have seen, gone and seen donkeys, haven't you? That's right. Well, that's right. You went and saw the donkey farm in Benson, didn't you? Yeah. Yep. Okay. There's a whole, wait, because we're in Arizona, there's a whole donkey farm. All right. But I did not rent one to step on our nice new carpet. All right, you guys, we got kids chat. Go back there with Miss Ingve. Sure I am on. Yep, I'm definitely on. All right. Well, welcome everyone here on this 
cold and uh, uh, windy Palm Sunday. Uh, we've had to set those palms up out there a couple times. Uh, I came in this morning, they were all, the wind had just taken all of them. Uh, but welcome here to worship, and hope you'll stay afterwards for coffee. And also, our prayer ministers are available today, being the fourth Sunday. They're going to be available over in that classroom over there. And of course, this week is Holy Week. And so we've got special services, so I want to fill you in on all of those before I get any further. First is Maundy Thursday, and that's going to be at 6 p.m. It's a little earlier because there's a dinner. What we're doing is called an agape meal. We did it last year. It's full of Middle Eastern food, really good Middle Eastern food. And we'll get together, and there's kind of a red liturgy. It's a little bit kind of a Last Supper reenactment. And, and so we eat, we'll have some readings, and at the end we'll come in and we'll strip the altar and get the sanctuary ready for Good Friday. If you, uh, I encourage you to sign up for Monday Thursday. It's the only like, service we sign up for because we have to plan for food. So the sign-up is still out on the credenza, but it's getting yanked after, the, uh, after uh, this service. So uh, sign up so they have time to prepare for the service, but it's right out there in the credenza. It is all ages, and you can bring your kids. So that's Maundy Thursday. Then Good Friday, we've got two different things going on on Good Friday. Uh, we, we're going to be doing our Stations of the Cross liturgy, as we have in the past. We've got some new artwork we're going to use this year. And so what I, did, I thought would be kind of an interesting thing to add for those who aren't coming out at night is from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. here in the sanctuary. I'm going to have the stations, well, they are already printed out on kind of a poster board about this big. I'm going to set them up on easels around the sanctuary. And there's a devotional book that you can follow along with at each station and a chance for reflection and uh, kind of go around, and I'll get some good, good ambient music, thank you, Stuart, uh, running in the background. And um, so just kind of a chance for you to self-walk through the Stations of the Cross. And then at uh, 6.30 will be our regular Stations of the Cross worship service, and that will be a service, we'll have hymns, and then we'll have the S Stations of the Cross liturgy. We'll use the new art. Uh, it'll be a slight, it'll be just, you'll probably notice a couple modifications. There'll be a little bit more time built in there between the stations, a few more pauses for reflection, but we also will have original music. It's always been great, so I hope you'll come. Easter isn't the same if you skip Maundy, Thursday, and Good Friday, I really believe. Uh, it's all part of, it's part of the discipline of it. It's part of the experience of walking through with it. So that's Good Fr Maundy, Thursday, and Good Friday. Then, of course, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. We have our two services, as we normally do, 8.30. And then after the traditional service will be a continental Easter breakfast. So it'll be a little bit lighter, but I hope you'll still come and for in the fellowship hall there. And the Easter egg hunt is still on at 9.45 a.m. That's going to be out on the playground and instead of out on the patio. And so that'll be there and then this service as we usually do at 10.30. So that's gonna be our Holy Week schedule. So I hope you'll be able to participate in all that. And that's my announcement. So that said, we'll move on to the sermon here. And um, we'll begin, uh, of course, it's, this is Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is the day we get to see Jesus, as I was trying to explain to the kids, brought into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey with people full of expectation. They often call this the triumphal entry, and it kind of bothers me they call it the triumphal entry because it's not really triumphal. Jesus hasn't fought any wars. There's no sports game that he just won. There's nobody climbing up telephone poles and jumping on uh, the eaves above stores and crashing things. Well, I'm sorry, that's Philadelphia um, after the Super Bowl. But no, uh, none of that. Uh, it's not really a triumph. He hasn't won anything yet. He hasn't competed in anything yet. Uh, but there's expectations. 
those kind of expectations are there. There's people looking forward to Jesus being things and triumphing. And, and so that's kind of the subtext of what you have on Palm Sunday. People's expectations and Jesus riding in. And the people pinning all their hopes and their dreams and, and everything they've wanted on Jesus as he comes in. But of course, not actually doing the homework to find out if that's who Jesus actually is. I, I got thinking about this. I was watching one of these, I don't know if it was a Dateline or something like that, one of these you know, crime expose shows. I've become strangely addicted to them. Uh, this, one, this one was about a guy who's a con artist, so nobody died. Uh, and I know the murder shows can get really addicting too, but the, the, nobody died in this one. This one was about a guy who's a con artist. And he was a pretty good, this was, guy was a really good con artist. And his con was to create a persona of himself, it was a false persona, as this very wealthy, successful man, and then he would go and find very professional, wealthy, successful women. Of course, if you're going to con, you con those who have money to con, right? Uh, and, uh, and so he would con them, and he'd go and impress them with how successful he had been. He faked being military at one point, pretended he was like a major or something, and he even bought the suit and had got fake medals to look impressive. He would go out and say, buy like a boat, you know, as evidence of his wealth, or he'd buy a fancy car, and then he'd, you know, take to a show and say, hey, see, look at how successful I am. And these women would see this guy, and he's charming and definitely never misses a day at the gym, uh, never skips ab day, you know, and, uh, and he'd go and impress them, oh, look at my boat, and, and, you know, and so then what they would happen, of course, is while they're together and not paying attention some night, he'd be at their computer cleaning out the bank account and would then claim that, you know, later, well, she, she agreed to it, right? That was kind of his, always his legal defense. And so then once the first woman would get smart to what he was doing, He'd change his persona, sell the boat, buy a car, you know, get, get a new suit, and he would start this over again. It was a little bit kind of sort of a Ponzi scheme. He'd use the money from one to con the next. Now, I don't know where he got the first money. I don't know which private equity firm gave him the seed money to begin the investment, or if he was just really good at bluffing. And the women he would con, they were really smart women. I mean, like, one of them was she was an engineer, but not like just an engineer. She had won honors as like one of the top engineers in her field of engineering. And she had started a business and uh, had this big like penthouse in San Francisco, super intelligent. Um, and she figured him out. She was one of the first to start noticing what was happening and got onto him and eventually started tracing some of the other women. But it took her a lot of work to get the to get the others to testify because they were so embarrassed. How could I be an MD and fall for this? How could I be a CEO or a, a, a professor? And I'm you know, so smart, so successful, so competent, and I fell for this guy who isn't even really a whatever he said. And by the time the courts caught him, he'd gone through like 12, 14 women at least. So he'd been doing this for years. He had kept up the con. And you know, you sit and you say to yourself, well, how could they fall to it? How could you be so smart and fall for a con? Well, we can all be really smart and fall for cons when we're really hoping and desiring something of someone. You know, when, and of course, attention always feels good. It always feels good to think somebody really loves you. And when the person who really loves you is not just that creepy guy down on the corner, but is buff and has a boat, right? He's checking boxes. And of course, this guy knows what boxes he needs to pretend to check. But, you know, there's that sort of phrase, you can be smart in life and dumb in love. It's why those internet love scams work. Because, you know, we so badly want there to be, you know, that Air Force colonel with the big boat who really wants me, even though he never seems to be willing to call on the phone or give me a picture. They interviewed a love scammer in Malaysia, 
Uh, he worked for a Chinese gang, what a weird global world we live in. And he said, love scams work about 75% of the time. It's the most effective way to make money. And that funds the weapons that he uses in his rebellion against the, the, the Myanmar government. But this is what happens, right? When we want something and desire something, it gets hard to be cold and rational and objective. It's almost like you're kind of living the dream and you don't want to run the risk that you're going to ruin it. You know how you're ever in a dream and somebody says, you know this isn't real, you know it's all going to end, and you're like, yeah, but don't wake me up from the dream. I don't want to go and do the Google search because if I'm wrong, it's going to hurt. And it feels good right now. That's what it's like. You want so badly for someone to be who you wish they were that you don't look at them for who they really are. And I believe this is almost kind of a spiritual gift, to have the presence, to have the objective view of things. Because really, God's the only one who really looks at things objectively, right? We know that we can't look at people or anything purely unfiltered. That isn't how our minds work. But that's how God can work. God has that vision. And, uh, you know, and, God, and so... This is why I believe our Old Testament lesson for today from Isaiah comes in handy, Isaiah 50. I'm not going to put it on the screen because I want you to just listen because that's what the verse is about. So listen again, verse 4. The Lord has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear, to listen as those who are taught. So, a few things here. What is the teacher's job? God gave the, the teacher a job. What is the job? The, he gave him the tongue of a teacher to do what? To sustain the weary with a word, it says. It's not information transfer. He's not, he's not, not giving you you know, st stuff here that you, to move from one brain to another. It's a practical thing. It's about bringing hope and peace to those who've heard too much and seen too much and been there and done that and are tired out. It's not to tell them everything's going to be okay. It's to sustain the weary with a word, to help them get through it. This is encouragement. I would imagine it's a lot of you-can-do-it kind of stuff. Two, what does the teacher do? The teacher listens to God's word. Now, it's not about having special education in this place, in this, in this situation. It's about listening to God every morning. To listen to God the way you want people to listen to you. To be the, te to be the listener before you are the speaker. I could have a lot of fun with this if this was a pastor's conference as a good manual to remember to not get so caught up that the first thing you do is email and not meditating. Because I guarantee you, one is spiritual and one is very not spiritual. One can ruin your day. I think it was, who was I here? It's Susie Orman? I don't necessarily watch her a lot. That's neither an endorsement or non-endorsement, but just to say that I just saw this clip where she said, the most productive way to do with your day is deal, deal with email at the end of the day. Uh, so you don't ruin your whole day and you lower your productivity. I've tried and I have failed. Morning by morning, I fail. But, right, this is the idea. That we wake up and we spend time in God's presence to be an effective teacher. We spend time in God's presence instead of trying to jam as many things in as we possibly can. It says that the path, the path to teaching is through listening. It's another one of those paradoxes of the spiritual life. I mean, think about how many problems in your own life you probably could have prevented if you had just stopped and taken a deep breath and thought about it and said, God, show me the way here before you move. Just pause for a little bit before you move. How many problems w w would you have seen before they happened 
if you just had a little bit more calmness of presence, I could tell you I would have saved myself a lot of headache many times if I would have stopped and spent more time with God rather than reacting. So the third part is the question, what does God do here in this passage? He says he opens the prophet's ear and gives him the truth. So God tells the prophet what he needs to know to do his mission. So listening honestly requires a lot of being open to things that you may not want to hear, you know? Like, this person is not actually who you think they are or who you wish they would be. Because it can get real easy to pin our ideas on people of who they are, pin our ideas on them, what we wish they were, to uh, project, as they say. And, and I know, of course, it's impossible to do that with no filter, but we can look at things God's way, right? All right. Which brings me to Palm Sunday. Brings me to Palm Sunday. It's not really a triumph, like I say. I don't like calling it a triumphal entry. I think it's more of a tragedy. It's a tragedy in the sense that they are celebrating, but we can see how it's ending. They are hoping and dreaming, and we can kind of see how wrong it is. Because we see all these people, and I don't blame them. They're oppressed, they're hungry, they're weary, they're tired of the Roman occupation and the grind. They live in a world with almost no opportunity or upward mobility. There's not a lot of hope. And here comes this guy. Here comes this Jesus guy. And to hope beyond hope that he could be the one that could, make a, that could fix this, that could change it, to pin your hopes on that one. You know, if I thought there was one guy that could fix it all, how tempting that would be, right? And they want that, and they dream about it, and they wish that, and they wish that with every time they fork over their coins to Rome in tax. They wish that every time they watch a soldier run into their house and take all their food and pull out a spear and say, you got a problem with that? They do, they, they do every time. They have to go hungry while they watch Herod and Pilate build bigger palaces. And they hope beyond hope for the Messiah with the sword who's finally going to take those bozos out. And then Jesus comes along and he can do miracles. And he speaks truth. And the crowd listens to him. Maybe this guy is the Messiah. But it was their hopes, their dreams, their wish. Jesus never said he was that kind of a Messiah. And I wonder, I've wondered, if maybe, just maybe, a lot of people in that crowd kind of knew Jesus wasn't that kind of Messiah, but they were hoping maybe they could get him caught up in the moment. Let, let's, you, you know how power can get to your head. Maybe if we can get enough power into his head, maybe he'll seize the moment for us. So is Palm Sunday a triumphal entry or an attempt at persuasion by the mob? Maybe get Jesus to start this revolution. The sad tragedy of Palm Sunday is looking out at all those people so hopeful for one thing and missing the point so badly. And I know I'm sitting here 2,000 years later and I can see things in hindsight and I can see the disappointment and the anger that's coming because Jesus is going to violate those expectations in a big way, and they're going to make him pay for it. Jesus never led them on. They just didn't hear what he said because they heard what he, they wanted to hear. They didn't listen to the words of the prophet to wake in the morning and listen as one who is taught. So we lose ourselves when we pin all our hopes and our dreams on one person,
to be the fulfiller of everything instead of putting those hopes and dreams in the God who really is. Amen. of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see I want to see you, see you, I lift it up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy. Please stand.
Let us confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. Holy God, today the church sings hosannas as we enter Holy Week. Prepare us to bear witness to Christ's suffering and death endured for our sake. Gather your people around the cross and comfort us with hope. Lord, in your mercy. Establish peace and justice among the nations. Hold to account any with authority to judge others. Grant that courts, legislatures, and local governments will serve with integrity and compassion. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, your love heals. Care tenderly for all whose loved ones perished from pandemic disease in every nation. Strengthen health care workers, first responders, and caregivers. Relieve all who live with chronic illness and pain. Lord, in your mercy. Give energy and joy to our pastors and worship leaders. Bless all those who are continuing to spread the faith to those new generations. Lord, in your mercy. Our time is in your hand, O Lord. Sustain us in discipleship throughout our lives. Receive us into everlasting life. We give thanks for the courage of Oscar Romero, bishop and martyr, who we commemorate today. Lord, in your mercy. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let's hold hands together as we pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.
body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. given for you. The body of Christ 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 given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Oh, kneel me down again. Body of Christ given for you. Here at your feet. Body of Christ given for you. Show me how much you love. Body of Christ given for you. Humility. Body of Christ given for you. Oh, Spirit, be the star that leads. Me to the humble heart of love, I see in Christ. You are the God of the broken, body of Christ, friend of the weak, body of Christ. You wash the feet of the weary, embrace the ones in me. I want to be like you, Jesus, for you. to have this heart in me. The you are the Christ God of the humble. You are the humble King. The body of Christ given for you. And now I may Christ bless you and keep you always. Amen. Yes, you can. The body of Christ given for you. 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 Jackson, may Christ bless you and keep you always. Amen. He's going to stay on that side. <laughs> Body of Christ given for you. Please stand.
us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We pray that we will never forget the sacrifice that needed to happen in order for our sins to be forgiven. May we continually die to ourselves as your son Jesus died to himself so that others may experience a new life. May we choose daily to take up our cross to be obedient to you as Jesus was obedient to his death. May our lives be pleasing to you and to others so they may know who the living God is this Easter. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'd like to ask the kids to come up again for the last song. Clap your hands.